<laughs> All right. Great. Well, uh, thank you everyone for joining us this evening uh, for this municipal permit awareness presentation. I'm Damon Yakovlev. I'm environmental planner at Cumberland County Soil and Water Conservation <laughs> District. Uh, our office is based in Wyndham, Maine, and we've worked since 1946 to protect soil and water resources in Cumberland County. Uh, joined today by Ali Clifts, the district's education outreach coordinator, who's on tech and facilitation, and uh, Neil Goldberg with uh, Maine Municipal Association as well. I'd like to thank Neil and Maine Municipal Association for hosting us on their Zoom account this evening. That's a big help for us. And also uh, credit uh, various other district staff who have contributed to the work we've done that we're going to be presenting about tonight. And uh, Christy Rubaska, um, who we adapted several slides from, who's a consultant who's a tremendous asset um, to our work in environmental conservation here in the region. So, um, so I'm going to go over the scope for, for this evening. Uh, so many of you uh, joined us last year uh, for a presentation on this topic. So the presentation this e evening builds on that presentation and includes some important new information. Um, so uh, we'll start this evening with an update on some stormwater re related legislation from Neil at MMA. Um, then we'll get into a background on water pollution, the Clean Water Act, and, um, and the permit, MS4 permit. Um, we'll talk about a contrast between the existing MS4 permit and the new one coming online uh, July 1st, 2022, uh, with discussion of uh, some of the implications for municipal staffing, budget, and ordinance updates that are very important for you all to know about. Um, some housekeeping. I'll, uh, this pre uh, presentation is registered with Maine Bar Association for one hour of credit. So um, if, if you're looking for that credit, make sure that you listed your bar number uh, so we can report it. Um, other PDH uh, certificates are available upon request. Um, if you'd like one of those, uh, just put your email in the chat with the credit you'd like, or you can email me uh, with that request. Um, and I'll mention that the level of detail here uh, aims to be most relevant for elected officials. Um, some of you who work in the environmental field uh, might find that this is a more of a refresher, um, but the, the level of detail really aims uh, to, to focus on what elected officials need to know about this topic. Um, some ground rules, um, we'll, uh, we'll ask you to hold questions for the section breaks and uh, several poll questions that we've included. Um, and then we'll have some time for question and answer at the end as well. And we're always available via phone or email. So with that, I'll turn it over to Neil uh, for a water related legislative update. Thank you, Damon. And thank you for having us. Uh, I am. Uh... It, it's always a pleasure to, to be with you um, and the stormwater group. And so I want to take the opportunity and uh, share with you a few updates on some water related um, legislation that might be of interest. Uh, the first four that you see are actually largely worked through committees um, and heading out with a uh, with strong support likely to pass. Um, and these are some uh, technical changes to classifications of certain waters, that's uh, LD676 in the Andrew Scoggin River, as well, as well as LD1801, some Class AA and SA waters, just four sections in particular. Um, LD1809 uh, has to do with floodplains, um, and is mostly a uh, uh, ex exemption to allow shoreland buildings to be silted or elevated in order to get some FEMA-related flood insurance. Um, again, heading in the right direction. Uh, and then lastly, the stormwater management bill uh, that allows uh, mountain biking trails to be permitted a little faster. Um, I, I've spoken to a few communities, no concerns surrounding that. Uh, the last two bills, the PFAS and PFOA bills, uh, do have some concerns. Uh, they would probably be supported amongst the group here um, uh, but largely does change some municipal operations when it comes to landfilling and wastewater treatment. Um, happy to talk about those more in depth, but in general, I encourage everyone to, have, to reach out to MMA if you ever have any questions, concerns, or comments about legislation like this. We're happy to talk, and more than that, we really want to hear your stories. It does help make our testimony a lot more livelier. 
Um, so uh, I won't slow down our presentation today, but again, please reach out to me uh, at any time to discuss these things. Next slide, please. This next update is also quite brief. It's just a remark that the ARPA funds, the American Rescue Plan Act funds that most people, probably all of you are aware of, they are out there, they are being spent, they are being appropriated. And so um, if you have a project that you think would qualify, I encourage you to go to your legislative body, encourage you to go to your town administrators or managers um, and make a proposal. Um, we saw in the final rule a dramatic expansion of projects that are eligible. Uh, I just did some kind of copy and paste from the final rule um, as to what sort of stormwater infrastructure or green infrastructure would be eligible. Um, and I put that up on the screen, but um, I, I, again, I just a, a broad expansion of eligible rules. And so um, my remark is put together a proposal, try to get it in front of your legislative body. If it doesn't get the funding through ARPA, you've at least gotten on their radar. Um, and so uh, it's wise to try to, you know, put a proposal together. During um, this meeting, I will in the comment section drop two links to resources about ARPA uh, that might help you with your planning. Um, but again, this is something that I'm happy to talk to anyone about anytime. So please reach out um, and uh, ask questions or, or share your stories. So with that, um, thank you. And I'll pass it back to Damon. Great. Thank you very much. Um, we'll pause for a second to see if anyone has, has any questions for Neil before we proceed with the rest of the presentation. Neil, I'll let you uh, call on people if anyone has any questions. Okay. I think they came here to uh, to hear from the star, Damon. <laughs> All right. Know, so I don't see oh. questions, but if you have them, put them in the comments and uh, I will respond to you quickly. Thanks, Neil. We really appreciate the work you're doing and uh, the weekly updates uh, are, are really, really useful. So thanks for thanks for that. Um, if you don't know, MMA has a weekly uh email uh, blast that they do with lots of really important information. So, um, all right, great. So, so we're going to start off by taking a moment to provide some context about why this is important and talk about um, some of the, the essential terms th that we use here when, when we're talking about protecting water quality. So um, we talk a lot about stormwater um, and stormwater is precipitation or melted snow that flows over the land. And it may pick up many other uh, items along with it, uh, some of which we don't particularly want to see in our, in our stormwater. That may include uh, soil, sand, sediment from construction sites, fertilizer, pesticide from lawns, uh, pet waste, um, road salt, litter, trash and debris, uh, many more things um, that when they're included with stormwater, they uh, constitute what's known as polluted runoff. Um, and that polluted runoff, in most cases, when it enters a storm drain, as pictured here, will flow directly without any treatment, again, in most cases, uh, directly to water bodies that you may use for recreation, drinking water, uh, fisheries, etc. cetera. So um, it's really important that we work to, to make sure our um, stormwater is as clean as it can possibly uh, be. So um, we... Uh, are going to open up a poll question here to sort of gauge sort of where you're coming from as far as what you think the most um, important uh, pollutant in your stormwater is. So Ali's opened up this poll. We'll give you all a minute. All right, see some responses coming in here. So it's a good test to see who's awake as well. And looks like sediment is the winner here and uh, some pretty sharp people out there because that is the number one pollutant of concern we have here in Maine and fertilizers are up there as well. So uh, good to see you all um, coming in here with some uh, good knowledge of the subject matter, so. Thank you for that. All right. So 
get the next slide here. So we all want cleaner water. We want to make sure there's, you know, we're reducing the, the amount of um, polluted runoff going into our water bodies. Uh, it's an important value and it's the right thing to do. It protects our economy, but it's also a legal requirement. So the Federal Clean Water Act, which turns 50 years old this year, authored by Maine's own Senator Ed Muskie, um, authorizes the Environmental Protection Agency to implement what's known as the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System, or NIPTES program. So uh, under NIPTES, a permit is required to discharge stormwater where certain criteria are met to waters of the United States, that's streams, wetlands, oceans, etc. So the main NIPTES program is administered by the Department of Environmental Protection. And um, for municipalities that uh, meet certain conditions, there's a, a permit that's issued. And um, those conditions include population size, density, urban development, adjacency to other population centers. There's 40 such permits issued under the program in Maine, and that's known as MS4. That's the Municipal Separate Storm Sewer System. So there's 30 municipalities and 10 other agencies that are included in this permit. Um, in Maine, the two other agencies are University of Southern Maine and Southern Maine Community College. So regulated municipalities must have this permit to direct stormwater runoff to water bodies in their communities. So if there's only one goal for this evening, it's for you all to be aware that your community has an MS4 permit. And uh, the MS4 program has been around for a while now. Um, in Maine, the first permits were issued in 2003, and they come in five-year cycles. Um, it's important to note that each permit builds on the previous permit in terms of, of stringency. Uh, so there's new and increased requirements with each new permit. Um, it's also important to note that the permit requirements are for urbanized areas in your communities as defined by the census. Uh, so the next permit's going to become effective July 1, 2022. And you may look, do the math and see that we're actually right now in year nine of a five-year permit. And there's some important reasons for that, um, which we'll get into in, in just a bit. So I mentioned that the regulated municipalities are determined by population densities. So we have um, 14 regulated municipalities in Greater Portland shown on this map here, uh, also includes Greater Saco. Um, there's three other clusters in Maine, um, extreme Southern Maine, uh, Lewiston Auburn area and the Bangor area. Um, so the MS4 permittees are subject to full compliance with the requirements in, in six steps. Um, and they're also required to work for improvement and protection of impaired water bodies, which are um, those that are most impacted by urban development. Um, there's heightened scrutiny from regulators that Maine DEP, EPA, and environmental citizen action groups. Um, it's also important to note that this is largely an unfunded federal mandate, although in some cases there may be funding available, um, such as through the stimulus funding or grants, but largely the cost to implement this is um, carried by the municipalities and regulated entities themselves. So the cost to comply with the permit though is less than the cost for non-compliance. So um, if you're not compliant with this permit, there are uh, fines per day per violation. Um, it's just something we all want to avoid. So, but the good news is that um, lots of uh, people and organizations are working to make sure that your municipalities are in compliance. So uh, your municipalities have um, hardworking professionals, key staff people who are working to ensure these um, requirements are carried out. Um, also, uh, there's regional support. So um, in our region, in Greater Portland and Saco here, we have what's known as the Interlocal Stormwater Working Group, or Izzy Week. So that's the 14 regulated municipalities and two nested entities. Um, they work cooperatively to address stormwater permit requirements. Um, we've, it's been coordinated by Cumberland County Stormwater Conservation District uh, since 2003. And it satisfies um, the permits education requirements as well as providing some other important benefits. Uh, the cost to municipalities for the upcoming fiscal year in our work plan is uh, just over $12,000, which 
Uh, it's considerably less than it would be to hire a dedicated staff person, especially in the current environment, uh, okay. to carry out uh, some of these requirements. And I'd also leverage uh, grant funding and uh, provides other support, um, yeah. in turn, the other benefits, and allows uh, for consistent messaging across the region, advocacy with regulators, uh, co collaboration with partners like MMA and others, um, and provides a framework for collective problem solving training and information exchange. Um, so with that, we'll take a pause and see if there are any questions before we talk about uh, some of the content of the new permit that's coming online. So I'd say just raise your hand and or type in the chat if you have any questions. And then Allie is monitoring that, so she'll let me know if any questions have come up. We'll pause a beat here, see if there are any. No questions in the chat just yet. Okay, thank you, Ali. All right, so um, with that, we'll move on to updates on what's in the new permit. So you may, uh, you may be asking yourself, so what's the deal with uh, us being in year nine of a five-year permit? And a big reason for that is um, some changes to the way the program is implemented by EPA. So uh, if you go way back to 2001, um, some environmental groups in California filed a suit in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Um, and the court found that there were several deficiencies in the way that the program was being administered, and it was not in compliance with uh, the Clean Water Act. So the two main findings were that there was insufficient public participation in the permitting process and that there was lack of permitting authority review, meaning that um, essentially the permittees were writing their own regulations and that the regulations should instead be in the permit itself and approved by the regulating authority. And in Maine, that's the Maine DEP. So um, after some years, a final rule was promulgated by EPA and became effective just before the current five-year permit was about to expire in 2017. So that's the main reason why um, this renew process is taking longer um, than the previous process. Um, and the key takeaways for us here in Maine um, for, the new, for the new rules, which are called the remand rule, is that... Um, Instead of having just one general permit, um, instead, uh, the DEP, the permitting authority, uh, could choose between two types of permit, a comprehensive general permit or a two-step permit where we'd have a general permit and then a second step with more details. So Maine chose um, the two-step option. So all of the enforceable requirements um, now have to be in the permit. They must be clear, specific, and measurable, and reduce pollutants to the maximum extent practicable. Um, and there are enhanced requirements for public comment and participation. So that has some important implications. Um, also, you may remember from last year that we discussed that there was an appeal of the final draft of the permit um, by Friends of Casco Bay, an environmental nonprofit. And um, this went to the Board of Environmental Protection uh, last summer, and the board um, agreed with um, Friends of Casco Bay on two, two points that have some implications for us in the final permit. Uh, the first has to do with um, impaired waters requirements. Um, so this doesn't deviate significantly from the efforts other, already underway in our communities. Uh, fortunately, we're already working to implement many of the impaired waters requirements. So um, no big deal there, really. But the, the second one mandating low impact development, citing um, MEP or maximum extent practical, practicable is important, has some important implications. So anyway, so where we are now, um, long story short, is that um, the general permit in this two step is, is done, finalized, and uh, municipalities are now waiting for their second, final second step orders for their permits. And um, however, uh, that process is, essentially um, involves a lot of collaboration with stakeholders already. So um, the final content of the two steps of the permit is generally known, 
However, it is still pending public comment and uh, some potential changes. So that's where we are, where we stand right now. And I will now talk about what some of the new requirements are. And we'll sort of compare and contrast with the per current permit. So um, there, again, I mentioned there are six steps. So the first one is um, public education and outreach. Um, so it's education of, so there's, there's um, some changes here. Um, and fiscally, there's some minor impacts that you should know about, but not nothing huge. The, the main difference is in the, the target audience. Um, so some of the things that are the same, um, the Think Blue Main program, um, the statewide uh, branding effort is still around, still the same. The yardscaping program, which helps homeowners reduce their use of pesticide and fertilizer products in their yard and incorporate uh, gardens and vegetation beyond lawns around water bodies is, is still around as well. Um, a key difference is that there's now an, a campaign to reach contractors to improve erosion and sediment control at construction sites through trainings, and also a campaign to reduce dog waste being left behind at public trails, parks, uh, and, and in your drainage systems, including catch basins. Some additional efforts here include school education programs and the main stormwater conference, which is coming up November 1st and 2nd in Portland at Holiday Inn by the Bay. If you're interested, uh, check that out on our website. So requirement number two is for public participation. Um, really, so just some minor fiscal impacts here. There's some increased opportunity for public comment and accessibility um, due to the remand rule. Um, what's the same here is the public event that we do, the Urban Runoff 5K. Um, so that's uh, gonna be happening in person this year at Southern Maine Community College campus on April 23rd. Um, so check out our website for more information about that. It also includes a virtual option for those who prefer to race on a different course somewhere. Uh, you can still participate in the event. Um, and requirement two also includes above and beyond events like stream cleanups, hassle, hazardous waste days, um, and that, et cetera, along that line. So. Requirement number three is for illicit discharge detection and elimination or IDDE. And um, some of the requirements here are the same, but there are some significant changes that have some significant fiscal impacts for municipalities that you should know about. So um, what's the same is that uh, this strategy is built around um, mapping your infrastructure. So where are your storm drains? Where are the pipes? Where are the culverts? Uh, where are the discharge points to the environment? Those are known as outfalls. And those are, those are a key um, sort of piece of infrastructure in terms of improve, reducing the amount of pollution reaching the environment because it happens at your outfalls. So under the previous, uh, the current permit, um, outfalls had to be inspected and it was a visual inspection. Under the new permit, there will be visual inspections as well as a new, more comprehensive procedure involving analytical tools and equipment, as well as laboratory testing. So this will all incur uh, a greater expense for municipalities and more staff time. So the good news is that at IZIWIG, um, we're providing significant amount of trainings and support for your staff at the municipal level um, so that you have all the information, they have all the information they're going to need. Um, but uh, there may be some, um, some more things in the budget that are requested as a result of this and some more staff time. So uh, I think it's important to make sure everybody is aware of that. Um, and also a heads up that in 2027, there will be even more stringent requirements in the new MS4 permit that's issued then. So as I mentioned, these MS4 permits get more stringent each cycle. So um, it's, it's almost certain that there will be requirements for wet weather monitoring at outfalls um, in that permit. So you don't have to worry about it yet, but it is something that would be good to have on the radar in five years or so. All right, so requirement four is construction site runoff control. Um, so there's some modest changes here under the new permit. Um, some things that are the same, um, there's still notification procedures, uh, uh, a requirement to keep a database of construction activities, um, inspections, um, 
The real big change here is that municipalities can no longer rely on some of the state standards. Instead, uh, an ordinance is required. Um, and that's something that um, we've also been providing support to municipal staff on. Um, fortunately, we were able to get some grant money um, in two phases uh, to, to provide some support on this as well and to develop um, in phase one, a checklist for municipalities to use to determine what new, what ordinance changes may be needed. And then um, actually in phase two, which is ongoing, there's a process through a multi-stakeholder statewide committee to develop a model ordinance. So um, that grant funding came from the, the main coastal program, the coastal communities program. Um, so we're really grateful for that. And it's not entirely borne by the municipalities and the grant program also allowed some incorporation of um, climate change and resiliency measures into that checklist. Um, so some added benefit there as well. So kind of in tandem with that is requirement five. So that's um, post-construction uh, stormwater management. Um, and there's not a ton of changes to some parts of this, but there are, there's one significant big change and that has to do with um, the outcome of that appeal um, by Friends of Casco Bay um, and the Board of Environmental Protection's order that um, requires municipalities to adopt an ordinance mandating low impact development. Um, so that's something uh, we've also got uh, grant funding to support. Um, so there's a multi-stakeholder process going on right now. Um, to develop that model ordinance. And um, that's expected to be completed um, by the end of this year. And then um, the permit requires municipalities to adopt that by July 1, 2024. So we have um, some time to, to work through all this, but and we're going to be pro providing extensive support to municipalities on it. Um, so there's several workshops that we have planned um, and one, is go it's going to start with some workshops that are kind of at a higher level of detail. And then we have some more specific community targeted workshops that we'll be doing as well in the next year in 2023 that will look at um, some of the ordinance changes that are going to result from this. Um, there may be minor changes to some other ordinances that are required as we um, as municipalities adopt this new model ordinance. And just to make sure everyone's clear, you don't have to adopt the model ordinance as written, um, but it provides a floor um, and is going to be reviewed by the DEP. Um, so if a municipality wanted to adopt a different ordinance, they could do that, but it'd have to be at least as stringent as the model ordinance. So now this is a lot of information, but we'll pause soon for some questions. So I promise. Um, so requirement six, not a lot of changes to this one. Uh, this is good housekeeping pollution prevention. It's measures that include uh, street sweeping, catch basin cleaning, uh, staff training on what to do in the event of spills and site maintenance at some of your municipal facilities. Um, these are all requirements that are in the current permit. Um, so there's some nuanced changes to the way catch basin cleaning is done, but um, nothing really significant is changing uh, with this requirement. So those are the six steps. And um, so the other major thing to everyone should be aware of are some of the new requirements for protecting your impaired waters. Um, so in, this doesn't apply to every community, but many communities have what are known as urban impaired streams. So these are essentially the most uh, polluted water bodies, the most impacted by urban development. And for each one of these urban impaired streams, municipalities must implement three BMPs or best management practices. Um, so some good news on this is um, we are able to develop um, two regional BMPs through IZIWIG um, to sort of reduce some of the um, burden on individual municipalities for this, this new requirement. Um, but each municipality is also adopting a community <coughs> specific BMP. So the two regional BMPs are riparian buffer protection and chloride reduction. Um, so that's from winter maintenance. Um, so there's some other technical changes associated with this, but as I mentioned, um, a lot of that is already um, being done as communities work to comply with what are known as TMDLs or total maximum daily load 
uh, requirements from the DEP. And we're making sure that your stormwater staff are well aware of what those are and how to make sure that they're maintaining the um, compliance there. So with that, we'll take a break, do a poll question and see if anyone has any questions at this point. So Ali, could you please launch the poll? Thank you. So this is a this is a two part question. So the first is, do you think your municipality will need to require more staff time to comply with the new MS4 permit requirements? And the second part is, do you think your municipality will need to allocate more funding to comply with the new MS4 permit requirements? So thank you. I see the responses coming in here. So it looks like, uh, let's wait a, wait a second for everyone to answer. All right, we'll end the poll, share the results. You should be able to see those. So um, yeah, so it looks like uh, uh, about half of you say yes, uh, the other half say either no or unsure. So the first one, so looks like um, you know you some of you may may need some more information and that's great because we're here to provide it and uh, the second question so I'm sure yeah so there are some you know some aspects of this that um, we won't know about until we start implementing the new permit for sure so um, but again we're sort of here to provide those resources and assistance uh, as needed so we'll close that down thank you Ali Thank you everyone for weighing in there. And we'll uh, go to one last section here and then we'll wrap up and- oh, Damon, there is one question at this point. Oh yeah, go ahead. Um, it was in the chat and the question is, if there's an appeals process for municipalities that feel a future permit requirement might be too strict or impracticable. Yes, there, there will be an extensive stakeholder process around um, the next permit, there, there, actually, there'll be even more of that because of the remand rule. So, um, yeah. So, I think there'll be there'll be ample opportunity to weigh in on that. If you're, if the question is specifically about the wet weather requirements, there'll be an extensive discussion of that. I'm sure. Um, was there another question? So far, that's the only one. Okay, thanks. So hopefully that answers the question um, there. So, um, all right, so a few final things and we'll, uh, we'll get into some more discussion, but um, so accountability. Um, so there's extensive record keeping uh, requirement and reporting requirements to maintain compliance uh, with the permit. Um, so that's something we work on at the conservation district um, for uh, compliance, especially with uh, control measures one and two um, we compile extensive information and provide that to municipalities each year for inclusion in the annual reports. Um, we also provide that information in the event of an audit. So every permitted entity can expected uh, can expect an audit um, during the five year cycle conducted by EPA and or DEP. Um, so when that happens, we provide um, all of the documentation that's that's required for that. Um, so, uh, we'll be looking for those to start happening over the next, uh, over the next fiscal year, most likely. So, um, just go through, um, sort of a timeline of, um, what you can expect going forward, um, from the municipal perspective. Um, so right now through the end of June, um, municipalities are working to complete their preparations to implement the new permit. Um, the final step orders are being prepared by DEP. So the second step orders being prepared uh, by DEP. Um, municipalities will be working to um, budget for new equipment, supplies, allocation of staff time. Um, July 1st, the new permit becomes effective. Uh, municipalities will be working to implement the new requirements. Um, and so will we at the regional level. Uh, the a key thing for municipal elected officials to be aware of is this, um, the process to update the ordinances to be in compliance uh, with the new permit. 
Um, so there's the low impact development and erosion sedimentation control ordinances uh, and that you'll be looking at these model ordinances and um, implementing them. And then um, the requirement is to have those in place by July 1, 2024. So that will go with a, to a final poll question and then turn it over to discussion. So Ali, could you launch the poll please? So it's just a general gauge. Uh, how much did you learn during this training? And this helps us to adjust how we do things going forward. So we'll give you all a chance to weigh in on that. All right, just give it another second here. All right. So thank you. So uh, yeah, we appreciate that. Hopefully we did get it just right, but uh, you know, we're here, we're, we're ready to answer more questions and provide support your municipalities need to comply with these requirements and clean our water. So just share contact information here on the slide and um, so we'll, um, we'll share this out to everybody who registered. Um, we'll also include a link to the recording of this presentation um, and a link to those documents that uh, Neil shared uh, for more resources about um, the, the Recovery Act funding and how that can benefit some of your municipalities um, and upgrading your infrastructure. So I'll stop the share there and uh, see if there are any questions. Um, another question came into the chat uh, that's about, if I could get my window to stop moving on me, <laughs> so everybody's starting to type in questions, about the DEP having significant pressure on some municipalities to finish their combined sewer overflow systems. Um, and so they're trying to figure out um, it seems like it's a direct conflict to the MS4 efforts. So they're wondering how they align the two um, and figure out their priorities. So if I understand the question correctly, so um, by separating the combined sewers, um, some of the stormwater may have been going to your wastewater treatment facility, but instead it may be going, your stormwater may be going directly to the environment instead. And um, correct. Right. So, yes, that is that is something that has come up um, for some of our municipalities um, in Portland in particular. Um, it's the reason why large holding tanks are being constructed so that the combined sewage can be held for treatment rather than um, having the stormwater be discharged directly to the environment. So that's that's a way that Portland is um, is addressing that. Um, the other thing that can be done as the um, systems are separated, um, more uh, low impact development measures, green infrastructure can be implemented. And that includes things like rain, rain barrels, collection systems, um, buffers, rain gardens, um, many other measures that uh, can help sort of clean the runoff and reduce some of the volumes involved. So that's all, those are all things that are um, part of the MS4 program. So, um, so I think that that sort of tries to mitigate some of the effects of the of the sewer separation. Um, yeah, hopefully that answers the question. Um, it's probably also important to note that combined sewer um, overflow systems are not being allowed anymore, and so every, all of the municipalities that still have those in existence since are being required to phase them out. Um, and so the primary point is that even though you have more stormwater that's going directly into your water bodies as untreated, the primary reason why it did need to be treated is because it was getting mixed in with your sewer potentially. And so that's why it was being diverted to your sewer systems. Yep, thanks, Allie. That is a good point. Other right. than that, that's the only question that I'm seeing in the chat. All right. Are there any additional questions? 
yeah, I also invite Neil. If there, is there anything you'd like to share? No, I, I think it was a great presentation. Thank you, Damon. All right. Thanks, Neil. All right. Good. Well, um, uh, I guess I'll say thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening. We'll, uh, like I said, we'll send out uh, an email with a link to the recording and some uh, resources or contact info. So please uh, feel free to get in touch anytime. We have someone at the conservation district who will answer your phone during business, answer the phone during business hours. So please be in touch. Let us know how we can support you. And um, I think uh, wish you all luck with uh, implementing the new permit requirements. So uh, thanks again for joining us. I hope you all have a good evening.